appreciate your patience. Hang on just a second, Alan. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up. Back up for me. Back up for me. Or no. For the world now. Hello, GateCon! And look at this! Mr. Peter Williams! Hello! <laughs> so much has changed over the years. The coffee carries a purse now. How are you, my friend? It's I'm good to well. see you. Yeah. Uh, so, welcome Peter Williams once more. You guys know the shtick. If my eyes go off inadvertently, I wear the sunglasses just so nobody gets injured and sues the place. <laughs> but for you, I'll take them off. And replace them with something that helps me see. There we go. How are you, good sir? How have you been? I think you can tell. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Fix my mic, buddy. Anything for a god. Something tells me I should have known how to do that. <laughs> I have been looking forward to having you on the show for... Um, uh, a while now, and it was just a matter of making it work. And I think that it's a treat here that I get to be with my family celebrating the work that you and so many amazing people did for so many seasons of great television. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure, and it's absolutely appropriate that it's this venue because exactly. GameCon is, is family to all of us, you know? And um, in fact, I think I know everybody here. <laughs> on some level, you know. When did you know this was what you wanted to do for the rest of your life? When did you know, you know, I want, I want to be on TV or I want to, you know, take on parts that are, you know, that put me out of my comfort zone. What was the spark? Actually, it's more like I want to be addressed as God for the rest of my days. Okay, I can do that. You know, that, who can turn that down? I, um... It happens. It happens on Twitter. It happens on Facebook. It happens in the subway. It happens in random streets of various international cities. I make it sound so grand. It happens, uh, you know, on other planets from time to time. I'm well-traveled. Uh, when did I know? I think, boy, you know, I was hooked. The very first convention I ever did was in Sydney, Australia, which is on the other side of this globe, for those of you that don't know. They had Christopher Judge down to appear, and he got busy and couldn't do it, and had the presence of mind to say, I know someone even better. <laughs> <laughs> and he sold me to them in Sydney, and I was instantly sold. Had a ball, and never looked back. That was, I think, 1999 previous century, so <clears throat> in Earth years. I mean more specifically you as an actor. When did you know you wanted to act? How old were you? <laughs> that would be telling, David. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Sarcophagus I years. There are people out here who are pretty adept at mathematics. <laughs> this is science fiction. Anyway, it's no secret that I'm really, you know, a couple of millennia old. Um, when did I know? Uh, you know, I'll tell you the truth. When I got out of university, I, a few years later than I should have, but that's a long story, um, I, 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 I wound, it, wound up in Ottawa, Canada. And for a Jamaican, that's quite a leap. <laughs> but um, while I was there, my brother dared me to audition for a play some of you have heard this story before, but it gets better over the years. <laughs> the, um, 
I auditioned for this play. It was Whose Life Is It Anyway? You, you may remember it from a movie that Richard Dreyfus was in about a quadriplegic who, uh, you know, facing the struggles of being a quadriplegic. I played a hospital orderly, and every time I opened my mouth, I, ha I got uh, uh, applause because I had the light. I was the light relief in a heavy themed screenplay. Actually, it was a stage play. And um, that month, Margaret Trudeau, the wife of our then prime minister, Pierre Trudeau, um, had an article in a, a woman's magazine, Chatelaine magazine, saying that Whose Life Is It Anyway was her favorite stage play. And we played to packed houses as a result. And so every time I appeared, I got the applause and I said, this is for me. This is for me. I, um, I really enjoyed it so much that by now I was, what, 23, 22, 23 years old. In sarcophagus years. That's, in sarcophagus yeah, years, yeah. Multiply by seven, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, that's dog ears. Oh, I, you know, I get confused. I get confused. Some people address me as dog. You know, it's God spelled backwards. Uh, and uh, I told you it gets better over the years. And, uh, you know, I got the bug. I got the acting bug, basically, is what I'm trying to say, the stage bug. And I, um, I immediately then decided that the civil service town of Ottawa, Canada wasn't for me, and I moved to Toronto to become an actor. So, basically translated, that means I became a waiter. <laughs> because it doesn't happen that, <laughs> that easily. So, I, after working in Greek restaurants and Italian restaurants and Jamaican restaurants and... Uh, general, you know, cafes, I got lucky and um, got my first speaking part in something, incidentally, which was a, I, I played a, I had seven lines or eight lines, I think it was, in a two-part miniseries called Hoover versus the Kennedys, the Second Civil War. I played a young Harry Belafonte, oh. which was just the perfect introduction to this business for me. Everybody told me at that point that I looked like Shari Belafonte, his daughter. <laughs> she was cute, so I didn't mind so much. <laughs> but um, it was a perfect entree into this business. Tell me about a role that surprised you in a way that you didn't expect when you're reading the material or when you're executing the material that you carry with you to this day as something that was pivotal for you as a human being. All right. Besides well, our dear God. Yes, besides that. Um, fortunately, I have been in the business long enough to have a resume. I can pick and choose and tell, uh, tell you stories from various. But I'm going to pick, uh, I'm gonna pick um, Neon Rider. I, uh, many of you don't know this, uh, this series, but it was my first series in Canada. And um, I went for the audition, which was scripted for, and I forgive the loose use of this descriptive, but it was scripted Chicano in the, in the, in the, in the, in the rubric, the character description. Back in those days, these were euphemisms for any minority will do. And I went in, and there were a couple of Latino guys auditioning for the part. But for some reason, they looked at me and they go, what's that accent? And I go, Jamaica. And they go, make it stronger. And I did. And I got the job. They changed everything. That's where everywhere it said Chicano, they changed it to Jamaican and encouraged me to use my accent, which in those days, again, was unheard of. I was extremely grateful, though, and it turned into a gravy train for me. I have since done a ton of Jamaican parts, which I love doing. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an educated middle-class boy who was taught to speak the Queen's English, so, the, any, any chance I get to use the language, that I, the, the, the pseudo language or the neo language that I grew up with is a, just a blessing for me. And I can, it's interchangeable with this very cultured speak that I have here, you know. 
Well, it sounds like the going message is, mm -hmm. wherever possible, be yourself. Be exactly. And so. I, yes, yes. I, in fact, I, t I took that lesson. I took that lesson from it, and I didn't prejudge. I don't prejudge auditions now. Nowadays, almost every part goes, submit all ethnicities. Something which works for me because nobody can really place me or stereotype me or pigeonhole me because I'm not stereotypically anything. African Americans don't consider me African American. Jamaicans, I'm always not Jamaican enough. You know, I'm clearly not white. I, you know, it's like I, I get, if the, word, if the word quirky appears in the character description, <laughs> call for Peter. And I win some and I lose some. So. 30 years in this biz has taught me that it all evens out in the end, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be in it for 30 years. And if you're good people like you, they want to have you back. Thank you, thank you. I, um, yeah. I'll take that, I'll take that, because I believe that's half the battle. I believe if they like you as a person, they'll try and shoehorn you in anywhere, you know. I have one more question for Peter, and then we're going to start taking questions from the audience. I would like to know how you got Apophis. I know you've a answered this question on stage before, but I have yet to hear it, and I'd love to hear it. And like I say, it gets better every time right. I tell it. <laughs> it was the winter of, <laughs> and this is where the audience chimes in, because I don't really remember, 98, 96, when, 97, 96, I believe. 96, 97, when the, the pilot of let, let me tell you, it goes back further than that. It goes back further than that. And it's a perfect segue because it goes back to Neon Rider. Neon Rider was, uh, opened a lot of doors for a lot of people here in Vancouver in the movie industry. It was right after 21 Jump Street. It was right after that Steve Martin movie that was shot here that everybody you know, knows someone who worked on. I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was... Roxanne, it was set in Seattle, and Vancouver passed for Seattle back then. It was, it was the early days of the film industry boom in Vancouver. Well, these local guys, uh, Winston Record, bless his dear departed soul, a, an actor here, he, he, most people know him as the Canadian Michael Landon. He, he looked a lot like handsome, like Michael Landon, just instantly recognizable to Canadians. He had been on several series, many, he had been acting for years. And his best friend, boyhood friend, Danny Virtue, father of two, one of whom now dearly departed as well, but two stuntmen that uh, you may or may not have uh, come across in your, in your Stargate fandom. The two of them got together, and they put together this, this uh, television show called Neon Rider. Well, we broke a lot of ground and hired a lot of new people into the industry, one of whom was an apprentice story editor by the name of Brad Wright. <laughs> Brad and I got close on Neon Rider. He would share his things with me. I would share my things with him. He was, after all, only an apprentice then. <laughs> One could approach him and speak very freely. <laughs> he told me about Stargate early on. I'm not sure he even remembers this. But being familiar with the movie, I kind of looked at him and I went, yeah, right, dude. Yeah, right. But he somehow acquired the rights to this damn thing. And it became what we know today. So that was my first brush with it. I got a call to audition for Stargate for a character with a real funny name. It had an apostrophe in it. Uh, apostrophe in it. it started with a T and it held, ended with a C. <laughs> so I go there to audition for this tilk part. <laughs> and uh, I thought I did a pretty good audition, but I didn't hear anything. And then one day I got a call back, but it wasn't for the tilk part. It was for another strangely named character by the name of Apophis. Of course, even the movie had no Apophis in it, so I didn't really know what I was coming to. 
At that stage, I had long hair. I had dreadlocks, which I had grown on Neon Rider over five years. It takes a long time to properly grow dreadlocks. Nowadays, you can buy them and get them 30 minutes in a, in a hair salon. <laughs> but, but These were the real deal. These were the real things. And it, it took five years to grow them. And I, I was fortunate enough to grow them on TV. So I can prove it. Yeah, so anyway, I go in for this audition, and here I am, you know, this, uh, this brown-skinned guy, aquiline nose, long hair. It did not occur to me that they were trying to recast Ra from the movie or wow. recreate the Ra you didn't character. Have any it did idea? not occur to me, even though I was a fan of the movie. Yeah. I loved the movie, Stargate, except for the last 15 minutes, and I thought it, felt, thought it fell apart. But it, it, it touched something inside yeah. me, and I'll never forget it. But it didn't occur to me that, that that's what they were trying to do. In the audition, Michael Greenberg, just, he just stopped the thing cold. And I thought, oh, God, I've really screwed up here. And he, I think he actually literally hit his head and went and pointed at me and nodded. Like, I took it as a good sign, but it was an odd thing to happen in an audition. I went away, it hap this was happening over the course of a Christmas and a New Year's. Well, I waited into the New Year, I waited and waited and waited and waited until finally, maybe three weeks later, I got the call, I got this part, Apophis. Yay, whoop de doo I had no idea what it was gonna be. <laughs> until the script arrived. Scene one. Damn, what an entrance. Okay, I'm in for this, I'm down for this. Wait staring a second. down Donna Davis. Wait a second. No, 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 no. Staring down Vaitiari Bandera. Oh. Yeah. There's stuff happening. And it's there happening for my benefit. <laughs> Wait a second. Showtime. Yeah. Hang on. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, uh, you know, it just snowballed from there. Ward uh, wardrobe calls were were epic because of, the, they had to build that damn thing on me. But they told me I needed to cut my hair. So it came with a price, but once I saw the price, I said, okay, <laughs> fair enough, hair grows back. <laughs> and the rest is history. That's how I got the part of a wow. office. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. All if right. I, of course. You know, if I got Tilk, I'd be richer. <laughs> but Apophis was the next best thing. I think the most, just one of the most iconic of, I, I, I will argue the most iconic of all the Stargate villains is you. Just, you just got to play it over the top. So. God love him, but I've arm wrestled Cliff Simon over that one a couple of times. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, but I agree. You never forget your first is my line. And that's what Amanda yeah. Tapping said, yeah. too. Never forget your first bad guy. Do we have questions? That hand went up first. Unless there was someone in the shadows. But it's up to Dave. It's his show. No, no, absolutely. You're right. Hey. I can't, we can't, the microphone is. Yeah, it's that little button. I, I, I learned that. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Pleasure, man. A little working now. Uh, so we just talked about the birth of Apophis. And in the last panel, the death of Apophis was mentioned. Uh, and Terrell was talking about what an emotional scene it was you know, with your death and how you, you shouldn't feel that way because it's I'm Apophis. I'm sorry, I must stop you. I must <laughs> sure. stop you there. Sure. Which death? Death number one. <laughs> yes. Touche. Serpent Touché. song. Serpent Song, death number one. Good, thank you. Yes. Uh, and, you know, it was, I, I, we just rewatched it recently and just thinking how kind of almost disturbing it was because you're going through all these mixed emotions as a viewer and, and like, what if all of history's villains had their death broadcast to an entire planet of people? It's kind of weird, right? Um, I was wondering what, in particular, you drew upon to evoke such emotion from the audience. What a good That's episode, a right? You know, yes, if I do say so myself, excellent episode. 
almost as good as that question. And, you know, you'll learn this about me. Ask me, how's it going, Peter? And you get a three-hour conversation. So here comes my answer. Apart from the fact that I was in every damn scene in that thing, and I got to work with all the stars in that show, which, of course, motivated me immensely, I drew upon the fact that after hair and makeup, the aged look approximated almost precisely what my father looked like when he died. And I was able to key in on that emotion. I nursed my father down to the end, as many of us probably have had the, the, uh, the, you know, the experience. It's not something you forget, regardless of your relationship with your parent. I was close to my dad, but in latter years, I saw him very little. And to see him, you know, go to, you know, deteriorate physically and mentally, but physically primarily because he was a slip of a thing when he passed away, was quite emotional. Once I saw myself in the mirror looking like that, I'm going, damn, they nailed it because that's what he looked like. I was able to just go there instantly. Not a problem. That's the short answer. The longer answer was, uh, it had something to do with the, um, mostly with the, the language that um, uh, Michael Shanks and I were speaking. Ancient Egyptian. Yeah, the ancient Egyptian to, to, you know, to communicate. Because there apparently is an ancient Egyptian course that you can take here at the University of British Columbia. And there was a professor whose specialty it was who was consulted on that language. The problem is, in the movie industry, you're always getting rewrites. So what happened is, on, on the, in the white pages and the blue pages, the full script came down with the correct ancient, ancient Egyptian. But by the time you have to do the rewrites on the fly and throw in the different colored pages to mix with the script, I think the story department was winging it. So basically, Shanks was speaking the real thing and I was talking gibberish. But we still managed to communicate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, man, good question. Just a moment, I, I love the scene in the briefing room where you have J.R. Bourne as Martouf saying, surely you welcome this guy's death. And all the heroes are like, not really. That's what defines a hero. Someone who looks at your worst enemy and still sees sympathy. Or still ha you still have sympathy. Even well, for it was worst. really technically sympathy for the host rather yes. than yes, the, the absolutely. actual Gawuld. Yeah. Um, and playing the host. You got to play the host in this episode. Yes, yes. Through well, a that nightmare. was a treat. That was a treat. You know, I mean, I have this sort of, I could, you could, I could be Egyptian. You know, I get people from Eritrea. I don't know if you know where Eritrea is. Eritrea is in the Horn of Africa. It's just, it's, uh, it's north of Ethiopia. I get Ethiopians stopping me in, in, on the street in Toronto and yak, 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 thinking I'm er Eritrean. So I definitely look like the people from that part of the world. Who else? Someone over here. Okay, number one. Um, I want to start cosplaying, so I want to ask this. Can you see with the glassy-eyed contacts? And can we have you say Shofa in your best Apophis voice you can muster at this current moment? I'm going to give you a little secret here. I have never, ever, not even once in my life worn contacts. So I did not wear contacts. The effect on my eyes was done in post, in a lab in LA after we shot it here. But just to run back to my audition for a second, one of the things I think that prompted um, uh, uh, Michael Greenberg to hit his head and go was the fact that I was able to do this. And I should have learned by now not to do this on stage, especially something that's going to show up on YouTube. 
But I can roll my eyes into the top of my head so you can just see the whites of my eyes. I, I, it's, 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 not a, it's a skill you learn in adolescence, and some people, <laughs> some people can do it into adulthood. I managed to be able to, and I did that in my audition. And I think Greenberg thought, oh, yeah, this will be, this will save us some money, <laughs> you know? So um, basically, really what they wanted was um, uh, no blinking and clear view of your eyes in order to do the special effects. So that's the eye thing. Uh, the Sholva thing, Yes, I can. I can do it. I can. I can do it. But that was also done in post. It. It was a, a, a flange. A, a process called flanging, and um, it altered my voice, uh, which has been the bane of my existence ever since. Actually, because I can't just take uh, a clip from Stargate and put it on my actor's reel because it makes me sound like, you know, like uh, boombox, like like a, a, a digital creation rather than an actor trying to get another job in real life. So it's been a bit of a problem, that flanging, but yes, I can do Sholva. <laughs> it's a bit of a party trick, so I'm good at it. <laughs> Tell us about Christopher Judge and working with him. What? Bes besides the flatulence, besides. which I know it comes up every time, what I have never met a person with a larger heart. Ditto. Got to got to support that for sure. Um, I, however, had to win him over again. All roads with me tend somehow to lead back to Neon Rider. Christopher Judge apparently. What, and he was at pains to remind me the first time I came across him on the set of Stargate. He goes, and are there any kids in here? Are there any kids in here? Because the language is about to get colorful. <laughs> he goes, I, first of all, I stick my hand out. Yeah, hey, nice to meet you, man. He looks at me and he goes, you don't remember me, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I was shocked because... <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. And you don't forget a guy that looks like that. <laughs> you don't. So I questioned my own sanity. And I go, remind me, man, remind me. And he said, I came and did an episode of Neon Rider. Yeah, and I went, what? I, I couldn't, I just didn't remember. And I still, for the life of me, cannot figure out why I don't remember that. Maybe, maybe we didn't work together, but still, he was certain that we had met before, and I couldn't remember it. So I think he has never forgiven me for that. However, <laughs> however, I, and I really, I, I can't forgive myself, because that don't make no sense. You know, you don't forget a guy that looks like Christopher Judge. Right. So distinctive. Yeah, so I must have been smoking some powerful weed that day, <laughs> or something, and I, I'll use that as my excuse, because... <laughs> <laughs> because it gets, it's legal now, and it gets me off the hook. <laughs> but Christopher Judge, I have to say, Christopher is the, is the actor on Stargate who was the nicest to me the entire time. I would hang out in his trailer, because he had all the good stuff on his TV. You've probably heard those stories, too. Um, and uh, he watched a lot of golf, and it was just, it was open house in his trailer. He was the most hospitable of everyone. I wouldn't say, you know, I, I, this is not to cast aspersions on anyone else's character, it's just, it, and also there's a brotherhood thing. There was a brotherhood thing that we, yeah. that we had, and um, I'm very grateful to him for that. He was your Sholva. He was my Sholva. Yeah, he was. Yeah. You, you roll the two syllables together like there's no apostrophe. So far. Yes. <laughs> You've got to honor the apostrophe God. if you're going to be part of the Stargate family. <laughs> Where's... Over here. Over there. Oh, there it is. Number two. Uh, I just was curious, what was the uh, typical shooting day schedule? Call times, how much makeup uh, that you had to endure every day? On the set. You know, that question is better addressed to Amanda Tapping and um, Michael Shanks, because they were in every day getting paid 
I was in every few episodes for one day getting paid. So I can't really say that it became uh, a routine for me. I grew to anticipate getting scripts with my character in it because I wasn't in it all the time. It became like Christmas every few months and I was in for a day. I got treated royally when I came in, mind you. As you should. Yeah, yeah exactly. But um, I can't say it ever became a routine day. However, typically those days start Actually, it usually starts beforehand because with Apophis having so many different costumes, I would always get two or three wardrobe calls for which you get paid. And did I mention I got paid for the wardrobe calls? Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, was, it was a blessing in disguise because all those things added up. Um, but wardrobe, hair and makeup, prosthetics, uh, fittings, those kind of things turned my, my, my involvement into Stargate into more of an intermittent thing. Uh, on set, always an early call. Um, always uh, I had to be dressed and sitting around in that damn fishnet stuff um, for, you know, far too long. But the trailers were really swanky. <laughs> Stargate had money. You know, that's part of the reason it was so successful. It started off with a four-season pre-sale, yeah. which was excellent, which is unheard of. And I've never been on a show since, before or since, that had that, um, that largesse. So not so much of a routine, man, but uh, a pleasure nonetheless. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And I'm um, sorry, in this age of gender, Equality. When I say man, it's just a Jamaican thing. <laughs> it's been emphasized in a lot of ways that Stargate was like a family. What did you draw on to, but you're their enemy, and obviously you can't be chumming around with them. What, what did you draw on to, to bring that out? And how did that affect things offset, <laughs> like off camera? I... I must confess, I did feel a little bit like the enemy, but I was a big enemy and I was all powerful. I got a lot, I got a lot of respect from top to bottom. Um, uh, I shared a, a passion for dogs with, with, with um, Richard Dean and his dog was always around and I, I'm a dog whisperer and he could tell, you know, it takes one to know one. And um, so we, we were able to bond on that. Oh, there was always a read-through too, right? So the read-throughs, I, I, was, I, was, I enjoyed the read-throughs because I, that's where I got to know everybody's personalities because there's always, you know, um, banter flying around. And uh, that's where I developed my real respect. Actually, no. Jeez, oh, I'm con con contradicting myself. I had worked with Richard Dean Anderson before on MacGyver once. And uh, so I did, have a, I did know him before, and it was a good part I had there too. So I got to know him over the course of a few days. Few, fast forward a few years now to these read-throughs for Stargate, and you really see the innate, nascent wit that guy has. It is natural. That's not no put-on shit. That's serious. This guy, it just... Flows. Yeah. So much so, the, script, the, the guys the, from the script department who were in there watching the read-throughs will immediately cross out what was written and insert the witticisms uh, that, uh, that Richard Dean would, you know. Of course, that made them look good because he is the boss. And, um, you know, and it made us, it made the show, it gave the show its little flavor. So... Uh, what was, what was the question? I'm just, I'm just... Did you feel like an enemy sometimes? Feel like an enemy. Um, well, yeah, sometimes, because those guys w were able to share what happened yesterday or the last week, and I couldn't, I wasn't there, I didn't know, so, yeah, 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 I felt like an outcast, not an enemy, an outcast. But I knew a lot of the cast before, you know, I, you mentioned J.R. Bourne. We had worked together on a movie many years earlier. In, uh, in Toronto at the beginning of our careers. And um, it was a show called, there's always trivia nuts in 
in, in, and I mean nuts in the nicest possible sense, <laughs> in, in a Stargate crowd. And it's a show called Jungle Ground. It starred a, uh, a wrestler by the name of Rowdy Roddy Piper. And um, JR and I had a uh, couple of supporting roles in that. Actually, Lexa Doig was also in that. Oh, okay. So so was um, Anne Marie DeLuise. She was. <laughs> so like I met a whole bunch of Stargate people before then. You know. So, so it already was kind of a family. Yeah, it was fa a family already. I was not so much of an enemy man as an as a as a, a distant cousin. <laughs> but how many shows have weekend barbecues where the cast and crew are invited back to the studio and they bring in bouncy castles for the kids, you know, and I mean that as far as I'm aware, that doesn't often happen. Well, you've just made me aware that it did happen. <laughs> now I feel more like a distant cousin. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Please, someone save my cookies. But no, but you know what? It's all right because I did. I had kids, and I was able to bring them to the set and blow their minds. And uh, um, I ran into. You run into people on this. I ran into Richard Dean walking his dog on the seawall in Kitsilado one day, on the on the beach, Kits Beach, and he was, you know, normally Richard Dean has a has his moods, you know, he can be kind of distant sometimes, and quite often he was distant with me. But that day he saw me, I was like his old lost friend. He had his dog, he made much of my kids, we stood there talking and we had a ring crowding around us just watching us. <laughs> I felt like a superstar that day and I'll always love him for it. He, he, spent, he spent maybe 20 minutes standing there de yakking with me and that wasn't his norm. So, you know, I, I didn't get invited to the bouncy castle but I got to hang, too with, big. hang with him on the beach. There you yeah. go. I would have I would have taken that over the yeah. bounce castle. Yeah, definitely. One more question from the crowd, and then I have a wrap up. Number two over here. Damn, is it over so quick? I know we started wow. a little late. <laughs> Hello, Peter. It is uh, absolutely wonderful to meet you. Um, I had a question with uh, regard to um, your character dying, and um, so as. As the audience, um, as the viewers, we, of course, were surprised um, um, by Apophis' death. And, of course, it was just a wonderful scene, um, just wonderfully acted. And, um, and you know, so it was a, it was a very big moment. Um, but then, of course, we find out that Apophis didn't really die. And then, uh, so, you know, so there's that. And I was just wondering, from your end as an actor, how much did you know, and how much were you surprised by this? Like, were you, did you know that you were going to come back, or how, what was it like for you, uh, for you as an actor? Thank you for this question, because it tees up what I was about to do next. Darren, be ready, I'm gonna bring you up here. Another excellent question, <sighs> for which I could talk, to, talk about, for th I could talk for three hours. When we were shooting, first of all, I was used to, ever since uh, Children of the Gods, where I was in it, pretty much the whole way through, but lots of little hits. I, um, I, I wanted to be in the show more, of course. So then I got, you know, uh, the rest of season one went by and I was used in the ratings week and the season closers and things like that, but never anything really, really, really meaty. Season two comes along and this script comes along. I, I, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, like two thirds of the way through the season yeah. though, yeah, uh, so cars popping yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. So it was. Uh, it's, the season starts off. Uh, more hits, little hits. I get to kill Sokar. That was nice. I get to kill Herur. That's nice. You know that kind of thing. Or did I? That was later. Yeah, that was later. Okay, whatever. It's all good. You still did it. It mixes up. Yeah, but it was what I'm point I'm trying to make. It was lots of little hits. Then boom. Well, first of all, I grew to recognize that any time the word serpent appears in this in the title of the show, I'm in it. <laughs> So this one comes along, Serpent Song, I go, oh great, I'm in it. Am I in it? I'm in it, I'm in it, I'm in it, I'm in it. I get to work with, um, with, 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 with uh, Janet Fraser. I get, unbelievable, that's amazing. I get to share screen time with Amanda Tapping. You don't know how valuable that has been over the years, trust me. 
funnily enough, I'll just, yes, it surprised me to answer your question. Basically, it surprised me. Um, yes, I was grateful for it. I knew I was going to die. I didn't know I was going to come back. They never tell you you're coming back. Um, although I must confess, I have this vague memory of Brad Wright going, <laughs> don't worry, right? And he was right. Your, um, oh. But yes, I just, I'll just finish off by saying, by giving, there's always somebody who wants to know, tell, can you tell me anything funny that happened to you on set? You tell me one prank. This is where the prank comes in, the number one prank. Um, Peter DeLuise, I believe, di directed that episode, didn't he? Yeah. A serpent Song, yes, he did. Serpent Song, yes. So, the following day, or was it maybe that evening, I was getting on a flight to Australia. <laughs> and so I had a flight to catch. Everybody knew that. And at the end of my final scene, Peter DeLuise goes, Excellent, that's a wrap, print. And then the lights went off. I was bound in a straight jacket on a gurney and everyone left the set and left me on that gurney bound in that straight jacket. I thought, okay, hey, titter, 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 that's funny. Five minutes go by. Dead silence. Uh, guys, <laughs> I've got a flight to catch. <laughs> Hello. Dead silence. They just left me there. Somebody eventually, maybe eight, ten minutes, and that's like an eternity in dead silence. Somebody sneezed or coughed off set, so I figured it out. They're having me on. They're going to send me a, in a limo to the airport. That's, everything's going to be fine. And uh, eventually, that broke the ice. But that was, that was the practical joke they played on me. I'm going to take up the last couple of minutes here because you are the reason that I am here. Ooh. Did you know that? Darren, will you come up and tell the story? In Shaggy's words, it wasn't me. So I joined Gate World in 2004, 2003, and got into this career. He started Gate World. Let me let him tell the story. Hi. Hey. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Darren from Gate World. Uh, I was season three of SG-1. I was a, a sci-fi nerd. I was newly married. Uh, my wife is here in the back. She was uh, catching up on Stargate. And this little episode came on called uh, Jolinar's Memories. You remember this one? Apophis was gone. Apophis was dead. And the show was building up a new villain in Sokar. And then here, at this cliffhanger moment at the end of the episode, Neonak takes off his mask. And it's... Apophis. <laughs> and I was floored, and that was, that was the trigger moment that caused me to walk over to my computer and start a little fan site. And that fan site grew, and it grew, and this guy joined. Uh, and we've just had a blast for more than two decades now, doing Stargate, covering Stargate, meeting fantastic people like Peter face-to-face. Uh, -face. It's a real joy. But it was that moment. It was, it was that episode, it was that writer, that director, and it was the moment that Peter brought to life that started us on this journey. So thank you. Thank you. So Gate World had its genesis on the planet Netu. Yeah, no, very much so. Yeah. And I probably owe you money. <laughs> Uh, I might collect on that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so thank yeah. you. Oh, pleasure. That's a great little anecdote. I'm glad I know that now. I think maybe you had hinted that, that uh, to me one time before because we had planned to do this. We really have been planning to do this for quite some time. You want him back for more on Dial the Gate? 
I have a couple more questions yeah, and, for the and, future. And I have stories. I'd love to have you yeah. back. But it would be my pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been wonderful. Um, I am humbled and honored to be here on the stage and had to bring Darren up, so thank you for that. This, this, I wouldn't be here without him, um, and we wouldn't be here without you. So you are, I don't, I mean, I love Cliff. Cliff Ball will always have a special place. Yeah. You are the badass that, that made Stargate what it is. Hey, well, And I know Cliff would forgive me for saying, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, speaking of Cliff, uh, you know, a special, special memory. I, I, I refuse to be morose about Cliff. He wouldn't have it. Correct. Um, I, I, and, but I, got to, I, didn't, I didn't ever meet a lot of these guys on Stargate itself. I have gotten to know them most off, you know, in, the, in the afterlife, so to speak. And um, Cliff was one of the most special because he was a real, real adventurer. And we, I would show up in the most remote places and there'd be Cliff on a bike, <laughs> you know, and, and, and he would say, let's go for, um, let's go for uh, Thai food. And I go, you know, what? I, uh, I'm Jamaican. I love my Jamaican spices. Um, the Thai spices are nice, but I just got to have my Jamaican spices goes, dude, you've not had Thai food. And, and Cliff, being a world traveler, knew a lot about a lot of things. So you knew if you were going to share an experience with Cliff, you'd be getting the real deal. And lo and behold, Cliff introduced me to so many new things. I won't waste your time by telling you, but, but you know, God bless him. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you again, Peter. Um, this is this is a treasure, and I, I look forward to to more conversations. I think there's still a lot to say. Yeah, there's more. There's more so, in the can. Absolutely. Everyone, thank you guys to enjoy GateCon. Oh, we got five more minutes. We're in bonus territory. Oh, yeah. Sorry, encore, Alan. encore. We need we need the crowd to go encore, encore, encore. There was some over and over here with a, who had a uh, hand up for the question. Sure. Right there. If we could get um, a mic. I'm sorry, Alan. I forget that you come out. And Alan runs this show. He does. <laughs> Number two. Yeah. Hi. hi. Number two. Sorry. Um, uh, firstly, hail a poppers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or Neonek, whichever you prefer. Uh, I just no, no, actually, Neonak, the guy who played Neonak has gone on to superstardom. He's uh -huh. very good. Good actor. <laughs> uh, I just wondered, um, when you were playing Apophis, yeah. you're playing the role of a bad guy, um, you see a lot from, uh, you know, um, Game of Thrones, the character who played Joffrey, got a lot of hate through social media and what have you. Did you ever experience anything like that when you were playing Apophis? Did you feel... You know, fans coming in throwing hate your way or anything like that. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The mask has garbled your question a little bit. Oh. If is possible, maybe just to I, I, I repeat. Can drop it. Yeah. I can drop it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just I wondered if in the days of when, when social media wasn't as prevalent, whether you received any ang angry fans because you were Apophis and maybe you you know you'd killed off someone's favorite character or you know you'd done you know. Up, upset a fan or something. Because I, th I think about the actor who played Joffrey from Game of Thrones, and he obviously got a lot of flack on social media and, and what have you. I wonder if you'd experienced anything similar. Well, to tell you the truth, um, that time I mentioned when I went to Sydney, Australia, because Christopher Judge couldn't make it, I picked up what might be loosely referred to as a bogey. Uh, I shouldn't be cavalier about it because this was a person with compound mental illness who um, decided that I was a perfect target for her and she made my internet presence very muddy for a period of maybe five or six years, causing me to approach 
Interpol and, uh, and, um, and the cyber crime units around the world. I wrote on spec to five different cyber crime specialists who were based in Brasilia, one of whom was a friend of a police a person, a detective in Melbourne, Australia, which is the home of this person that was muddying my internet presence. I contacted him and he said, basically, I can't do anything for you unless you are here. As serendipity would have it, I got booked to go to Melbourne very shortly thereafter. I'm trying to make this story really quick. I get down there and I call him up and he goes, yep, you need to go through this court process. So I spent a whole day in court in Melbourne. At the end of the day, the judge looked at me and said, how long are you here for Mr. Williams? And I said, till next Tuesday. Then she slammed her folder shut and said, I can't do anything for you unless you're here for three weeks because this is a three week process. After I had spent all day in court. So I went back to the policeman and I said, this is what happened to me. At that moment, my daughter, who was at university, said, Dad, you got to do something about this because this, this person had now discovered my family and was harassing them. She said, I just received 100 emails from this person. And I said, stop right there. I'm on the phone with the cops right now. Send me those emails. She sent them to me. I sent them to the cop, and I hear the cop on the other end of the phone. Literally, I'm standing there in this hotel in Melbourne, Australia, and the cop is going, Oh dear, oh dear, uh-huh. And I go, sir, so you see what I'm, I've been saying. I think it's about time we lean on this person's family. And I kid you not, this was his response. He goes, well, mate, leaning is what I do. And at that moment, I knew I was in. Leaning is what I do. He went around to her place and it was like a movie. My picture was all over her walls, on her laptop. It was, she had, I wasn't the only one, I have to say. It was myself, Brad Pitt, Britney Spears, and a model in England who had, her name was Jordan, who had dared to walk the runway pregnant. This girl was, oh, she's an unfortunate. I had her removed from the internet three times, but she is part of an advocacy group for uh, shut-ins who got her reinstated on the internet. She's still out there, but she has sort of cooled off, cooled off the abuse. But you, there was a time when you would be Googling my name, my character, and you would find some of the nastiest things possible, which were clearly not me, because it was clearly written by someone who had issues. It was clearly not me. Uh, but people jump to conclusions that this is someone I had done wrong to on the road or something, you know, had a fling with. Yeah, but it wasn't. It was just compound mental illness that I have a little bit of sympathy for, but it, got, it went beyond that. I hope that answered your question a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it all ended well. I don't want to finish it on that note. No. <laughs> okay, sure. Let's, let's, let's no, bring it up good. again. Let's bring it up so again. One more. One more. Bring it, yeah. Uh, oh, there we go. I was originally going to ask you about the ancient Egyptian on Serpent Song, but you got ahead of me there, unfortunately. So my question is, uh, in regards to you returning, did you know if that was in their cards when you originally died, or is that something they kept back and wanted to return later if they thought it would be useful? that Brad's nudge? It could have been Brad's nudge. If, the short answer is no, I never knew I was coming back, but it became so repetitive that I sort of assumed it, <laughs> you know? A, a safe <laughs> bet. Yes, even, even towards the end. Season eight, Christopher Judge writes an episode, I'm in it, right? right? And then Continuum, I'm in it, albeit yeah. for a second and a half. But what but, a great second and a half. Oh, we were yeah. in the theater iconic. With, the, with the crew, and it was like, whoa, man. It's like, yes. That's when I miss Cliff the most, because we used to reenact that scene. It took no time. He would just chop my head off on stage, and that would be it. They'd bring the house down. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Peter, for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And thank you, GateCon, for this wonderful introduction, reintroduction of us. My name is David Reed, and I'll see you on the other side.